I'm going to go through uh, my slide program here today and hopefully I can give you some uh, information, something that you can take back to your program. Um, and I know I was just talking with Tanner that anytime I've gone to any of these coaching clinics, um, it's always been something that I want to take something that I can use and something that's going to be beneficial to my program when I go back and my team. So um, keep in mind, as I tell some stories and some different things, try to relate it to how it uh, pertains to your situation and what you can use from it. Um, <clears throat> so I'll start off by just talking about success. And um, ultimately, I think, you know, in coaching basketball, and I have two jobs, I'm a teacher and a coach. Um, phys ed is a lot different than coaching varsity basketball, as you can imagine. Uh, in basketball, we have one measure of success, and that is simply the scoreboard, wins and losses. Um, and again, that's not the only measure of success. And I think ultimately you have to find out what is your goal and what is your vision for defining success in your situation. And I'll talk more about that as we go on. Um, we have you know, a lot of different uh, positive years recently, and, and you can see some of the numbers there. But um, going back, it didn't always start out that way. Okay, it's, it's been an evolving process of 25 years of coaching. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that as well. So um, just down at the bottom, you'll see you know, some of the things that we've had many university players uh, I've had some guys go on and play pro. And um, one of the things I pride myself on is one of our graduates who became a doctor. Uh, and this guy used to play Thursday nights with us, pick up basketball, and he just loved the game. And it was, you know, something that um, I share the story because you can do academics and you can do basketball at the same time. And I always tell guys, this guy was in the gym Thursdays playing pickup to later nine at night. And um, it was a very talented basketball player, but he just loved the game. So um, it's great to have people in your program who do things like that for you as well. Um, every player that I coach, one of my goals is to maximize their potential. Um, and I tell them from day one, look, I'm going to push you harder than you've been pushed. I'm going to try to get the most out of you. Uh, it's not going to be easy, um, but that's, that's where we're going. And uh, with that, I think when you have those expectations, um, and there are bumps along the road, as, we, as you'll see, but um, you know, I think they realize that um, you're trying to get the most out of them, and, and I think kids appreciate that. Um, we're always trying to develop people on the court, but also off the court. Uh, being at our school, it's, it's a lot about academics, and we've had issues with, you know, kids taking themselves out of the basketball because of the academics. And I always tell them, guys, you've got to make sure you put yourself in a position to be a part of this. Um, don't jeopardize your situation by doing anything stupid around the school. I'll give you kind of an outline of some of the things that I expect from them. I've got a list that I give them in our first meeting. Um, and I think to, to lay, lay it out on the line right from day one is very important. Uh, we like to compete, and a, long, a lot of times when you compete, ultimately part of the um, situation is that you end up winning, and we've had a lot of success. Uh, and I'll talk more about that as well. So how are we going to do this? Um, and again, we'll kind of run through this pretty quickly, but uh, if you want to take out your phone or just a piece of paper, uh, I like the phone because the phone is always with you, and um, oftentimes as a coach, I'll just be writing things down or something comes to my head. Um, I'll put it in my phone and say, oh, yeah, I just you know, realized that. So if you want to write down one of your best ideas in coaching, uh, there's been some great speakers already this uh, last seven days or six days. So maybe one great idea you learned so far. Okay. And again, you can come back to this later if, if you need a little time to think about it. Um, and I'll, I'll touch on this at the end of my presentation as well. Starting out, I think one of the things you have to, uh, as I mentioned, come up with is your plan. Um, one of the things I always looked at was, you know, I want to have guys in my program who are good and successful in the classroom as well as, uh, you know, on the court. And I think, you know, when you have that vision and you lay it out for yourself, um, ultimately you're going you're gonna to see the end at, at the beginning and then come back to it. So it's a building process. Uh, for us, our championships were always in March. And I think it was something that we always looked at that March was the end of all this. So the, the things that happened along the way, you're going to have some learning um, situations. You're going to have some guys understanding things as you go, okay? And you need to create that vision for people. Our first meeting of the year, we talk about Wednesday, March the 6th, 8 p.m. in Windsor. And we say, that's the gold medal match. That's where we wanna be. So our kids understand that, that that's part of our goal is to get to March. And it's not how you start, but it's how you finish. And you have to have confidence in that vision. Uh, early on when I was teaching and coaching, there was a lot of um, early season workouts where I was struggling to get guys to come to practice. And, um, you know, it takes time and you have to build that vision and, and believe in it. Um, more recently, we've had, you know, successful programming. Kids now are dying to come. I've had like 30, 40 kids running hills with me. Um, guys who are, you know, doing ball handling in the hallways. So ultimately, if you have that vision and you say, this is the path to get to that success, a lot of times, you know, it'll happen in time. 
Um, I always like this quote from Nelson Mandela. It always seems impossible till it's done. And when I started uh, back at St. Mike's, I was a player there. We had never won an Officer Gold Medal. And it was kind of a vision and a, a dream of mine to put us in that position. Um, and we've had three gold medals since. Um, and I think, again, when you put that vision together and you kind of keep building towards it and believe in it, um, it's a possibility to get there. Um, one thing that's important, I heard, um, I think it was Coach Jockham talking about the other day, this idea, don't focus on the scoreboard. Uh, it's interesting because if you focus on the process, um, and again, you know, kids are always going to look at the scoreboard. I, I coach my daughter who's, you know, six years old. When she was six years old, started out, and the kids, as soon as there was a basket, they're all looking at the scoreboard. And it's amazing how we get caught up in that. And I think, again, we have to kind of tell our players, look, just, just keep playing. Keep doing the things you want to do. The goal is to get better. The success and the scoreboard will take care of itself. And I think also that takes a lot of pressure off them. Okay, and we've been in a lot of championship games over the last number of years, and, and kids get nervous. Um, you know, and, and the best thing you can kind of remind them is to say, listen, just go out, do your job. Don't worry about the scoreboard. It'll take care of itself. And I think when they start to focus on that and we say, you know, just do it our way, then the confidence builds. Um, ultimately, you do have some success, and the score works out to be what it is. And sometimes you'll lose games, but um, I think when you build that mentality, it really helps your players. Um, and ultimately with us, it's like, you know, early in the um, development of our players, our first year guys are always the most difficult because they're trying to understand and figure out what we're trying to do. And we have a very uh, detailed system, and I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that today, but uh, that could be another talk. But when they do it our way and they're all on the same page, we have success. Um, and when they, when they don't play our way, then I have no hesitation to say, okay, you're sitting down because you're not doing it that way. Do you understand these are the things we want from you? And it takes time. And um, part of that is to gain their confidence in understanding that we're all doing this together. Uh, and I think when you do have that success, they start to see it. And ultimately, when I've had players in my program, second, third, and in some cases, fourth year, um, it's amazing how they're thinking much like you're thinking. Um, you don't have to do much coaching at that point because they really understand it. Um, obviously, a guy like Danilo down at the bottom there, um, he's had great success both on and off the court. And um, it's almost like having a coach on the court with you. So again, when I was a younger coach, one of the things for me was, you know, I thought, you know, I played for some good coaches. I thought I knew the game. Um, and going to a lot of these clinics, you start to realize, wow, maybe I don't know as much as I thought. And there's so much information out there, as you can see, with the coaching clinic uh, for the last 10 days or the upcoming 10 days. But, you know, just take things, okay, and learn from them. Steal the best ideas. If there's something that you think is important to you, uh, grab it and apply it, okay? Um, I've read lots of coaching books, not just basketball coaches. I've read all kinds of NFL, hockey coaches. Uh, anytime I can pick up something that I think might be of use or value to me, and again, leadership books, teaching books, uh, going to clinics, coaching seminars, um, courses, anything professional development. And again, you know, talking to other coaches in our school, I think that's one thing people always say, you know, you guys have a good sports program. Well, I'm sitting in a phys ed office with some other amazing coaches. And you, I can't tell you the number of times we've talked about our own sports and just coming together and using ideas saying, oh, I tried this, what'd you think? Um, and so when you have people like that around you, um, you never stop learning, okay? And then you can apply it to your own situation. Um, when you watch things, okay? Oftentimes when I watch games on TV, I'm watching the coaches, what are they doing? Okay, I'm observing and saying, okay, how do they interact with those people? And I think, you know, those are, those are things that you can pick up from them, ideas that you can put back to your program. Um, a couple of people that I looked up to, and I love the book, Pat Riley's book there and Coach K's book. Um, they were some of the better ones early in my career. And oftentimes I go back to them and look at things that they've done or, you know, it sticks with you, it resonates with you. I was fortunate myself to have some great uh, teachers and coaches. Uh, I've got the list there going from my grade eight coach, Mr. Ryan, Paul Dignan, Dave Tessero, Dan Prendergast, Mike Lavelle, Barry Phillips, Joe Razzle, and my dad, you know. And um, it's amazing when you take stuff from those people. Um, and believe me, you know, Joe Razzo and Dan Prendergast are two completely different guys. Um, and, and yet, both of those guys have huge impact on me and some of the things that I do. So I think it's important to look at your mentors um, and try to be that mentor as well. And I think when we do that with kids, um, ultimately, the, the biggest compliment you could get is when a kid comes back and says, hey, you made a difference in my life. Um, you were important because of what you did and what you said. Uh, and don't underestimate that. Um, it's what you learn after you know everything that counts. And again, um, having thought I knew a lot of stuff, you know, and, and it was funny because I had two guards coming into my program who were 
Canadian national caliber players and Malcolm to Vivier and Dwayne Otis. And I looked at it and I said, how can I use these guys? And I had some preconceived notions of what my offense should look like, what I should do. Um, and I started hearing um, a little bit about the dribble drive uh, offense. And I looked at um, John, uh, John Calipari and um, I read something about him doing the dribble drive. And then I heard uh, Jay Wright speak. Um, I think it was at Humber College as well. And I said, you know what? I think that's the perfect offense for my system, especially with these guys. I can highlight them. And um, Jay Wright, his, his offense is a lot more complex than what we've ever used at St. Mike's. And, um, but I just took some ideas and I said, okay, how can I simplify that and make it easy? And from that, you can create your own situation and your own offense. Um, and I remember I had um, somebody tell me, you know, they love watching St. Mike's play, our teams. And he said, you know, it just makes it, you guys make it look so easy on offense. Uh, it looks like you can get any shot you want any time. And of course, we had some guys who really understood what we were doing. Uh, so it's, it became fun and the kids loved it. Um, and it's, it's difficult to scout against. Uh, we just had some basics. And again, uh, I've talked about that before, but um, at another time and place, if you're interested, I can tell you more about it. But again, we made it fit our needs. Um, don't be afraid to experiment as a coach. Um, again, there's things I've done and I go, oh man, what was I thinking? That, <laughs> that was awful, you know, but uh, you try it and you see what works. And uh, again, as you go on as a coach, if you're progressing and learning and trying different things, you're going to find better and better things like inbounds plays or um, offenses, defenses, little junk things you can throw at them. Uh, in 2013, we had a um, pretty good team. And it was interesting. Our best player, Malcolm, got hurt. He was out for a number, um, number of months. And when he came back, he said to me, Coach, I have no problem not starting. And it was amazing because I had a guy in my starting lineup that probably didn't deserve necessarily to be a starter. But he was a great kid and he was loyal and he did the right thing, did everything you asked him, showed up every day. And so the unselfishness of Malcolm with the idea of having 10 players that fit pretty well together, we ended up doing hockey shifts. And it was like literally four minutes, five guys on, five guys off, um, and it worked. And it was something very strange. Um, at the end of games, obviously we would tinker with it a little bit, but kids knew the roles, it worked out well, and um, it, was, it was different. Um, it was interesting, I talked to Coach Altabello at uh, Christ the King, and we were down in Binghamton, we were beating them, and I happened to run into him at the hotel after, and he said, God, Coach, what a great game. Like, we didn't know anything about you guys. Um, and I'll talk more about this, but we, we knew a lot about them. We scouted them, we looked up online, and we were up about 13 points in the third quarter, and he said, you know, I thought it was over for us, I called the timeout, and he says, we don't press. We don't use full court traps or anything, and he said, you know what? I said to the guys, we're going to press, we're going to go at them. And our guards were a little bit younger at the time, so we ended up turning the ball over a little bit. We lost at the buzzer. And it was interesting because he said, it was not something in our game plan, but we tried it. And he said, you know, we were probably going to lose by 40 or we we're going to get back in the game. And it was just something as a coach I kind of remembered and I thought, hey, you know what? Sometimes you just got to change the pace of things and try something different, even in the midst of a game if you haven't done it before. Um, some of you guys know this coach. Um, obviously, he got a lot of um, flack initially, but I think people started to respect the fact that he was playing, you know, I think it was boxing one and, and some junk defense. But um, obviously, having someone like that as our role model and saying, hey, you know, even at the NBA, this guy's trying things that maybe have people haven't done since high school. So um, don't be afraid to try those things and um, apply it to your situation. Um, one of the things, you know, for me is, is as a coach to be firm. Um, and I, I'm a big proponent of discipline. Uh, it doesn't mean you always have to be tough on kids, but um, kids want discipline, okay? And um, if you hold them accountable, and I had Dwayne Notice come back to our banquet uh, last year and talked about um, how I'd held him accountable as a young man and how he remembered that. And it wasn't easy necessarily all the time because as young people, they think you're picking on them or you're upset or, you know, they kind of want to do their own thing sometimes. But um, I think you need to do that. And you got to be fair about it. Um, this picture here, it was interesting. We were out in British Columbia and we just won a championship. And one of the things I always tell our guys, you know, when you win or you lose, you know, do it with class and make sure that you're not celebrating, you're not intimidating or uh, bullying or, or making everybody else look bad. And we can celebrate in the locker room. 
And we had two guys who were taking a team picture after the championship. And these guys were hooting and hollering and doing silly things. And I just told them, guys, celebrate with class. And there was a lot of people there looking at us. And it really disappointed me. And so anyway, we got home and one of my coaches said, geez, I saw the picture. Like, what was going on? It looks like you were yelling at somebody. And I said, yeah, I was. Because I was very upset that these guys were showing up the other team and, and acting the way they shouldn't have. Um, we got back to Toronto the next day. We met with them and ended up kicking two guys off the team because I said, guys, we just talked about that. That's, that's, you, you went too far. Um, and again, I've had kids we kicked off the team. In some cases, they do come back because they learn and they say, hey, coach, you know, like I understand now. Um, and I said, okay, we can deal with that. So and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But um, as a coach, one of the things, and I love this, I always tell from my science class to my phys ed class to my players, do your job. Okay, I even tell my kids, like, Everybody's got a job to do here. And it's funny how sometimes, you know, we'll be in a um, practice and I'll have guys there and they, they start uh, saying, oh, that was a foul. That was a foul. And, and literally I'll stop the practice sometimes and I'll say, here, do you want the whistle? Step off. Okay, you can referee. And they get so like taken aback. I say, look, your job is to play the game. Don't worry about the officials. Your job is to play. I will referee or someone else. And, and you know, it's not always going to be what you like. And uh, I've said many times we go on the road. I'll tell you a story in a few minutes. Um, where you don't get calls and you, your players need to be able to adapt to that and understand that. So move on and, and don't worry about it. Um, I heard a couple of coaches uh, and, and some great presentations about building your own pyramid. Uh, this is obviously most, you know, John Wooden and his leadership um, pyramid of success. Okay, and I think it's something, again, you got to figure out what are your values? What are your principles? Sometimes it's tough to give them the love and the discipline that they need. Some parents are going to give you a lot of flack. Okay, I've had that over my career where parents maybe don't understand or come back at you. Um, but sometimes I'll say, no, this is, this is a core value that we have. Okay, and what you tolerate becomes what you're accepting. So if you're going to accept things in practice or on the bus or, you know, something like guys wearing earrings, which is against our school policy during class time, say, guys, no earrings. Okay, and if you start to tolerate those little things, they add up. Uh, I heard a great story way back. It was one of my first clinics. Um, and I'm not sure if it was Hubie Brown was telling the story about uh, there was a coach and basically the, uh, the player was out on the court and he started yelling at the guy, stand on the line, started, stand on the line. What are you doing? When I tell you to stand on the line, you stand on the line. And um, the kid was looking at him like, what's this guy's problem? Like, why is he yelling at me about the line? I'm like two feet away from it. And he said, you know, the point is, if you expect something as little as it is, that's you becomes your expectation and kids if you don't give them that leeway and you tell them exactly what you want when it comes time for a championship game and you tell them something they're going to know exactly what you mean okay so great little lesson there from that story um, i always say guys you know every detail matters okay they think i'm a nitpicker they think i'm picking on things and again early in the, in the season when i've got guys for a first year um and, and trust me i can't stand some of the early season scrimmages because they just play the game so poorly but it's like, guys, every detail matters. These are the things we want. And when they start to understand those details, I think you get so much more out of them. Okay, so again, your expectations of what you want. Um, and I had a, a guy the other night at our banquet, virtual banquet, saying, hey, coach, I still remember this day. You wait for the bus. The bus doesn't wait for you. Um, hey, yeah, you know what? Be on time. We're all waiting for you. And I get so angry when we're, you know, on a bus and we're all ready to go and somebody's not there. And, and one year going to an officer game, I left a kid behind with one of our starters. And I said, guys, this is selfish behavior. Like everybody's counting on you. You make sure you're there. And again, if you can't be there, then you let us know. That's another thing I'll talk about is communication. But um, we demand excellence. Uh, it's interesting. I had a player a couple of years ago and, you know, I could still tell he was frustrated. And I said, listen, I'm not going to lower my expectations for you. These are the expectations we have in our program. Okay. And this is what I expect. And I want them to rise up to that level. Um, and it's, it's tough. Early in the year, I will stop practice quite a bit. I know some coaches don't like doing that or like the flow. Um, but sometimes I'll make a point of just saying, okay, hold up, guys. And I'll say, was that a good shot? And the whole gym's listening. And, and again, because I draw attention to it, they start to understand. I think this is one thing as, a, as an offensive coach. What is a good shot? And at our level, I tell guys, we can get an open shot anytime. We just need to do the things that we do in our offense, and that will come. So when they start taking, you know, contested shots or, you know, shots from far too out, far out, then I need to call that out. And obviously over time, they start to understand those things and become second nature. 
Um, when things are at their lowest, okay, that's the beginning. And, and I heard this from Pat Riley uh, reading his book. You know, and, and it's funny as a coach, sometimes we're in a situation where maybe we're getting blown out or, you know, just everything's falling off, the, the wheels are falling off and we're in bad shape. But as a coach, you need to understand those are the moments and that's the time when the kids are looking to you for the answers. And as a coach, never forget that because that's when they're listening the most and you can take those situations and say, okay, look, it can't get any worse. This is where we want to go from here. And it will get better. It takes time. Um, you need to find the negative situations and find the positives in those. Uh, we had a situation, um, I think it was around 2011, 12, and we ended up two, three of our best players. Um, I had to kick them off the team right before playoffs. We had already been um, into offset in the tournament. And the team we played in the semifinals, we had just beaten them about a week earlier by 30 points. We ended up losing the semifinals, first loss in our league in, in years. Uh, and it was tough. We went into offset and I thought, man, this is brutal. We're just going to get crushed. Brought up some junior guys. Uh, we had a pretty good player in grade nine whose mom didn't want him to come. I was like, oh, no, another shot there. Like, we could have used this guy. And we played the host team in the first game, Coach Cusimano down at CCH. And Pac Jim, I've never been more proud of our team. These guys were awesome. They just worked their butts off. Um, I think we ended up losing by about six. Uh, wonderful game. And I was so proud. And I remember talking to Coach Cruz after, and he said, man, I heard you lost some of your best players. He goes, I wouldn't want to play you guys without, you know, with those guys in the lineup. And I said, yeah, you know, sometimes things happen. And going back to your values and principles, this is something that crossed the line. And you know what? We ended up the next game, we played um, the second round. We lost about 95 to 30. And, um, you know, it was the beginning. It was the beginning of our success, if you can believe it, because I think it sent a clear message that we're not going to tolerate certain behaviors and that we're going to keep going. And we ended up winning the uh, Friendship Award, which I thought was a great uh, compliment. And it was the beginning of the success. Within the next, I think, seven years, we had six um, Final Fours. So sometimes you got to look at that and say, you know what? This is what's got to be done. It's the right thing to do. And the success will come after that. Um, as tough as a coach as I can be, I think ultimately you need to show kids you care. Um, I think that builds trust, shows that you believe in them. Um, it might be, and I, I know one of the other coaches was talking about, just having conversations with your players on a regular basis. So often I'm in the first guy in the gym and I'll be there and talk to the guys, how's everything going, how are your classes going? And I think you, you start to build that rapport and that relationship. Um, and again, you're, you're not always necessarily going to connect with every single kid deeply, but I think this builds the trust. Um, we had um, two of my managers who um, one became a player and actually uh, from there, um, he was a manager. He said, coach, I want to play. And he just wasn't that good. But I said, okay, over the summer, work on your game. The kid went off and then he came back and I go, kid's pretty good. And I remember telling one of the coaches, like, he's looking good in trials. The other coach looked at me, almost laughed. Are you kidding me? And I said, look, you know what? We're going to reward that guy. He's on the team this year. And um, it's interesting. That kid almost made a university team, which was great. Um, and again, when you show you care, you reward that loyalty of putting him on the team or you reward the loyalty of the guy as a starter. Okay, I had a kid from Switzerland there in the front picture and he kept thinking he was struggling and he said, yeah, coach, I don't know, like, uh, almost like, why are you starting me? And I said, Josh, like, you're playing great. You're doing all the things we ask, you're doing defense, you're unselfish, we need you in the lineup. And again, it gave him confidence that he wasn't out of place. Um, and I think sometimes you have to have those conversations. Um, there's a manager in the, in the picture here. You'll see uh, Julian Bootsy. Okay, and uh, you'll notice over here, he's in the, the year-end picture. So he came to me at the beginning of the year, and he had broken his foot over the uh, summer, and his dream was to be, and he said to me, I want to be on the wall. He said, um, my dream is to be in uniform and to be in the picture. And it was amazing because, again, he wasn't that good, and I thought, you know, it's not fair to keep him, uh, but I can't cut this guy. I said, look, why don't you be the manager? And he says, yeah, well, okay, coach. And, you know, he wasn't too happy about it. And I, I think he actually went away and came back the next day. And I said, okay, do you want to be a part of this? And, and you can practice when you're healthy. And he said, okay, well, under one condition. When I get healthy, you give me a shot to make the team. And I said, fair enough. Uh, maybe fortunately he didn't get healthy throughout the year. Um, but at the end of the year, right before the Office of Championship game, I brought everybody into the um, – we're actually in the squash courts up at Nipissing. And we're, we're talking, and I said, okay, guys, look. And I had a little pregame speech for the group. And I said, there's somebody on this team that we're going to win this championship for. And of course, everybody thought I was talking about Danilo. And I said, no, it's for Mootsy. 
And I said, this guy, his dream is to be in uniform for the championship picture. And so I had my um, <clears throat> co-coach grab the shirt and jersey and we gave it to him. We said, put this on. And I said, when we win the championship, you're going to be in the team picture and you're going to be a part of this. And he says, like, almost, <laughs> he was almost crying and other guys in the room were getting teary eyed. And I said, okay, let's go out and do it. And it was amazing. At the end of the thing, we're celebrating and Mootsy comes over, he goes, coach, coach, can I take off the shirt now? And I said, absolutely. Like, so again, you know, when you reward those loyalty and show that you care, um, I think that goes a long way. Um, so great story with him. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about this. If you ever want to read or find out, there's some, some videos on these guys. Um, you know, the Navy SEALs, I was fortunate enough to go down, visit my mom. We went to the uh, Navy SEAL Museum, but um, you talk about resiliency. Okay, and again, sometimes kids don't think they can do things. Uh, the only easy day was yesterday, their, their motto. But again, just keep pushing. And, and you know, we always say to guys, look, just keep playing. Don't worry about it. Just keep playing. We'll get there. Um, and I think sometimes that, that takes time. Um, we've played some games over the years. Like, you know, we always like to play a tough schedule. I think that helps. You're, you know, um, I heard Coach Sullivan talking about coming down to, to play some games. I always give those coaches credit. Take your lumps, but your kids start to see, hey, this is how we're going to get better. And we played some games in the States um, against prep teams and guys who are 20 years old. Okay, so we get beat. But I think that resiliency at the end, it helps you in developing those players. I remember Butch Carter came to our school and, and spoke. And uh, one of the things he talked about was um, kids are going to bump their heads. Kids are going to make mistakes. Um, I think as a, as a coach and a teacher, you have to understand, don't take it personally. Kids are going to do those things. They're always going to test you. Um, but I think it's important for you to teach them and discipline them. Okay, those are learning opportunities. I think that builds trust. Turn those negatives to a positive, as I said, um, and expect it and use it. Um, I remember listening to Coach Smart talk uh, years ago, and he talked about changing the rules. And it's something that um, I've really tried to adopt and use in my practices and, and with my guys. Once they figure you out, change it. Okay, so for example, we do shell drill. And um, oftentimes I'll say, okay, today, guys, two points for a charge, because I really want them to get a charge and, and teach that and emphasize it. Okay, or I'll say, okay, today offensive rebound is worth a point. Um, so again, all of a sudden things change. You know, we don't use out of bounds when we're playing shell drill. So you change the rules sometimes and you get something different or they raise the bar. Okay, and as my doc, good friend doc used to say, ask little, receive little, demand much, receive much. Okay, so when you demand a lot, these kids will rise up. Uh, quick little story here. These, these guys in the picture with me, uh, we were playing baseball down in Windsor. And I said, okay, guys, we just finished a double header. Um, we we're in my grade 11 phys ed class and I said we're going out for the coaches are going out for a run along the riverfront 5k and my two guys in grade 11 phys ed says yes coach we just played baseball and I said okay no problem I said but don't you guys have perfect attendance and perfect like runs every day you've, you've done the run oh yeah coach and I said okay well I'm going for the run if you want to join us we'll be in the lobby in 10 minutes the guy on the right there had just caught two games back to back as a catcher and he came down and ran with us. And it was amazing. But it was, it was something I thought about after. And I said, maybe I was too tough on these guys. But I just put it out there and said, hey, you know what? I'm changing the rules. Like, if you guys want to join. And I was so proud of those guys for doing that. So sometimes when you, you know, change those rules and, and you give them different expectations, they'll rise up. Um, when I travel, and, and we do, um, I've done a lot of March break trips and things like that. Um, one of the things I always make sure is, is that we appreciate. I always tell our players, like, make sure you thank people in the restaurants, thank people on the planes. Um, it's very important. And it's a simple thing, but I think it goes a long way. Um, you know, how do we treat people? And um, I think this is very important to teach young people that, you know, it, it may be the coaches, it may be the parents, okay? Um, this guy on the right, the janitor, or um, the guy who used to clean the gym for me at the tournament, his name was Dharma. He used to be there at 5.30 in the morning, cleaning the whole gym, you come in, ah, oh, Dharma, like, uh, Jim was a mess. Jim was a mess coach. I cleaned it all up. I did all the popcorn. So I used to take care of him, bring him a little gift. And um, this guy would do anything for me. But he was the guy that if he didn't clean that gym, the gym's a disaster. Okay. Uh, we've had some bus drivers who became our friends. They were cheering for us. So again, how do you treat those people sometimes? And it's easy to overlook them. Um, and we try to make sure that people we treat everyone with respect. Um, now there's a picture of me there with the uh, referee. Um, and I always tell my players, don't say a word to the referees, okay? The officials, that's my job. Um, and if you can believe, I'm sure um, if I gave you a guess at how many technical fouls I've had in 25 years, 
I don't think you'd guess it, but I've only had three. And um, I get away with a lot. And I think it's partly because I've built up some friendships and some respect with a number of officials. And sometimes they'll say to me, all right, Jeff, that's it. You crossed the line. That's enough. That's it. I'll stop. Um, but I think, again, when you have that mutual respect, okay, um, I had an um, usher in uh, Binghamton, New York, and he came up to me. He says, coach, he says, I don't have a son. But he said, I can tell you if I had a son, I'd want him to play for you. And it was something that really was amazing to me that this guy had watched how we interacted with people, how we had said hello to people, how the players responded to me. Um, and I think that's something really important that, um, again, how do you treat people around you at all times? Uh, do you say hello to the people at the table? Do you thank them after the game? Okay, do you clean up your bench and your dressing room? Um, I've run a tournament for many years, and it's amazing how many dressing rooms are a disaster. Okay, um, and as a coach, that's your responsibility. And get guys to do it. Okay, and it's not always easy. Uh, but I think that mutual respect, you, you build up relationships over time. And obviously, appreciation, like uh, I've got my family that uh, I spend a lot of time away from. Okay, it's very important. At the end of the year, I always try to get them something. When I go on the road, I bring my kids a little gift, um, a thank you uh, picture with the team for, for the girls and, and my wife. So I think showing that appreciation is really important. Okay, um, as much as people see sometimes my gruff exterior or the way I'm acting, uh, it's intensity and I'm okay with that because you know what, behind the scenes we have a lot of laughter. Um, here's some fun times and, and traveling and doing some things. Um, there's a nice picture there, um, one of my, my top guys here, Peter Hale, great kid. Um, anyway, we're, we're at the restaurant before the championship of the Catholic and, and we've kind of made it into a tradition that it's always somebody's birthday <laughs> when we have the team uh, dinner and Peter had no idea that it was his birthday. So of course the dessert comes out with the cake and everybody's singing to him. He's looking around and, you know, so we have a great laugh. And I think it just sometimes brings that camaraderie and that, that uh, friendship. And uh, sometimes we forget their kids, you know, and they have fun with it. Uh, I have another little joke I play every year. And uh, I have this uh, almost baby sized uh, practice Jersey. So when uh, we receive our, our gear from Mark Bain at Nike, thanks Mark. Um, I always make sure I pull this one out of the closet and I give it to one of the guys that I know, you know, he's looking forward to getting his gear and it's like a baby size. And I go, all right, in this case, Kyle, here's your uh, practice jersey and hold it up for the whole team to see, you know, and we have fun with it. So they, they sometimes see that and they have a lot of fun with behind the scenes. Um, there's a video I'm not going to have time to, to show today, but you can look it up on YouTube. Um, but before the uh, Office of Championship in 2013, uh, we put together a little skit in the dressing room. And some of my players to this day don't know that it was uh, set up. But again, before championship, kids were all nervous. First time we'd been in a final uh, off. So I had one of my assistant coaches actually cut my tie in half right before the gold medal game. And actually we brought out the gold. I'm wearing the gold for the golden ticket uh, sports. But um, we ended up, uh, you know, he pulled a, a gold tie out of his pocket and said, you know, get rid of that tie. And he cut it in front of the whole team. And, you should have seen the looks on those guys' faces. But again, it was something just to relax them and, and see that, you know, we're real and we can have some fun with it. And uh, I think it just broke the tension. But um, anyway, um, next point, seek and you shall find. You know, it's really important as coaches that there's so much information out there. Um, one of the things I always look at is who can I ask? Who, who are some of the people? And I, I show you some mentors. Um, I got a good buddy, Eddie Coyle in Philadelphia, who was an Olympic, Paralympic athlete. And I remember having some great conversations just about life, about leadership, uh, how to do things. And he was a great guy. We traveled to Russia and did some conferences there. But um, <clears throat> anytime you need something, you can call him. Okay, we got um, my, my King Mendigas down there in the, in the trunk and, again, having fun with them. But sometimes those guys get overlooked because people look, especially young people, say, oh, the old guys, they don't know much. But uh, I think Coach Razor made a great point the other day talking about you need some of those people on your bench. You need some of those people around you. I used to always bring in Coach Prendergast and say, can you talk to the team? Just give them a few words. Um, and I think it's always important to have some of those people around and contribute to your program. Let the kids see, like, hey, this guy, he's been around for a long time. He's done a lot. Um, again, we need other people. Surround yourself with good people. Um, it's really important. I, I mentioned my managers. Okay, I've had some unbelievable managers. And, you know, in addition, he's kind of, these are the forgotten people that those guys are with me every day. Okay, I've had... Um, you know, Elliot Mayhew is now a chiropractor. Um, Murphy, I mentioned, Mootsy. Um, this guy here in the middle picture, he's with Dwayne and Danilo, Kelvin Lee. And, and this guy was like a basketball junkie. He knew more about the Raptors than probably Coach Nurse knew. 
Um, but listen, coming in every day, he was excited. I said, hey, if you want to practice, jump in. Sometimes you need an extra body. Um, but he was a great guy. I got Julian Hawks who has been with me this year. And having those conversations and allowing them to be a part of it as a coach, believe me, get yourself a good manager. Uh, there's been years I've had two. Okay, Botswain helped out this year. He's like, can I be around? I said, yeah, absolutely. You know, those guys can be invaluable. Um, avoid toxic people. Okay, some of the people, you know, I know um, Coach Sullivan mentioned yesterday, sometimes you lose a big game. I've had people in our building, okay, never say a word to me when our team wins. And then all of a sudden we lose and it's like, hey, what happened last night, Coach? Heard you guys lost. Okay, I don't, I don't have the time of day for those people. Okay, yeah, yeah, didn't go too well. Just move on. And you know who they are now. Okay. Um, Branko can be negative, but we put up with him. So that's okay. He's a good, good guy. Okay. And sometimes I'll say, Branko, just let me deal with the kids. You tell me your opinion and I'll deal with the kids. So again, there's ways to figure that out if they're adding value and your coaches, do you give them value? Do you have them included? Okay. And I'm a pretty domineering personality, but uh, believe me. Okay. Those people get a voice. They have their opinion. Ultimately they don't get a vote. I'll be making the decision and that's okay. Um, and they're fine with it. Okay. I talked about loyalty and commitment. Okay, and I think that's something that's really important as well. Um, I'm going to say something about building relationships. You know, I've been at this for a number of years, and we've built up some great relationships. I always laugh when we go down to Erie, Pennsylvania, because um, the two rival schools there, uh, McDowell and Cathedral Prep, uh, those guys don't get along too well. But it's amazing because we get along with both. We keep getting invited to both places, and we play games against them because we've fostered those relationships over time. Uh, my coach, uh, coach I've coached with a long time, Nunzio Corrente, has been great about setting up an American schedule playing tough games. Okay, we got invited back to Binghamton two years in a row, one of the only teams ever. I think it was the first team ever. Um, again, because we built up those relationships. We're in Florida at the hotel. My wife got to know people from Ohio, and then they invited us the next year. So uh, make it a point when you do those things, you know, um, build those relationships. Um, again, a lot of the tournaments we've gone to, the Catholic, the Heinbach, uh, New Brunswick, the Freeds, we keep going back because of the people. So again, it's easy to build those things up over time. And again, through appreciation, I've been to Taiwan, I've been to Italy. Uh, I've got some great coaches there I was coaching with in, in my daughter's teams now. Um, one thing as a coach, okay, and, and again, Coach Razzo mentioned it, my worst fear is not being prepared. There's things I got to have in place, and I want to make sure that we're prepared to start this season. Um, our preseason, we put a lot of things in place, okay? And then during the year, it's like, man, we're spending so much time scouting. Branko does a great job. Uh, oftentimes, I'm sitting in the gym. People think I'm on my phone. I'm scouting the teams. I'm putting all kinds of information there, preparing, okay? And again, I always tell the guys, listen, anticipate. Don't react. If you're reacting, you're too late, okay? Think ahead. I want guys on the court that can think, okay? And again, any scouting report is better than nothing, okay? So it's important to look at those things and find those things out, okay? It's interesting in that regard, years ago, we played uh, in the 2017 final, okay? And we had prepared and done a great job in the final. And it was amazing because I think we took out a lot of the things they wanted to do. And of course, a uh, great player for St. Benedict's ended up hitting 52 points. And we almost lost the game because of it. And it was one of those situations that, you know, I was just hoping we didn't lose the game because I thought we did so well to stick to our game plan and give them credit. And I think this guy looked around and said, I got no other options. He just started shooting and got hot. And uh, some of you remember that game. It was pretty amazing. Um, I always tell kids, look, don't tell me things. Show me. Okay. I have a quote under promise and over deliver. And, um, you know, it's really important to get kids. Um, you know, I got the picture down below. I run hills with them. Okay. I'm out there. And so the last few years have been a little tougher for me to get out and run those hills. But, you know, I'm there. And I say, man, I got to do this because I think it proves from in training camp that I'm giving them more than they expect, okay? And it used to be easier for me, but I think once they see that, there's a lot of trust that's built. And I think they, re they respect that, they recognize it, and you can always come back to that. Um, teach good decision-making. I think it's really important that, um, you know, you, you allow them to make those choices. But again, it takes a long time to develop that. When I have players playing for me for a number of years, they ultimately understand what I want, okay? So you prepare them in those situations, just, you know, and again, those questions, was that a good shot? Okay. What could you have done there? Could have taken a charge. Okay. You're getting it. It's coming. Okay. So that's development. Um, it's interesting. Years ago, Malcolm, who uh, you can see in the bottom there, I was refereeing our inter-squad game and I gave him a, a technical foul because he uh, was complaining about a foul. 
And he's like, oh, come on, coach. You know, and I double teed him and I threw him out of the scrimmage. And it was amazing because it was a real close game. And Malcolm was so ticked off and he was just burning. And you know, Malcolm's a super competitive guy. Um, and you know what? Flash forward to we're at the Catholic tournament. We're ready to play in the finals, watching the other semifinal. And a kid gets double teed. The best player on one team gets kicked out. And I just looked over at Malcolm and I said, hey, Malcolm, would you have done that? He says, no, no, not me, coach, not me. And it's amazing how when you teach those lessons, it resonates with them. And obviously at the time it was a difficult lesson, um, but he learned it and he got it. Uh, so again, sometimes you can do those things. Uh, what's done is done. Okay, learn from your mistakes, move forward, find a solution. I mentioned this before. Okay, um, we're down in uh, Erie, Pennsylvania, and it was 11 fouls to one. Okay, and Danilo and, and Nelson Caputo both had three fouls in the first half. We're up 10. And the kids were steaming in the locker room, and you know, I was riding the refs pretty good. And uh, I said, okay, guys, look, there's nothing you can do. We're in Erie. Like, don't expect calls. This is going to be the same maybe in St. Catharines, who knows, maybe in Windsor. Just play. And Danilo said to me, yeah, but coach, every time I go near a guy, I get a foul. What should I do? And I said, don't go near anybody. And he kind of looked at me like, are you crazy? I said, just back off. Put your hand up. Challenge them. But get out of the way. Don't, don't even go close to them. We'll be fine. And we ended up winning the game by 20 points. And it's something, again, if you get players to understand that that's, that's irrelevant. Okay, you're going to get bad calls. You're going to get bad calls in practice. Just keep playing. Okay? Um, and I think they learned from it. Both those guys um, in the Office of Championship years were injured for, you know, months, a couple of months in the season. And, you know, you're going to have injuries in sport. What are you going to do with it? Okay? And I was looking and say, okay, time to move on. The other guys will be better. Okay? Let's move forward. And if you can find that solution, in the long term, you're going to be better. And the rest of the players are going to be better. And when they come back, your team will be better because of it. Okay? Don't assume players know. Uh, too often we think they know. Make sure you're clear and specific. Okay? Even then, okay, some of you remember the Office of Semifinal in 2018. We had a timeout. And we told the boys, okay, make sure you foul. As soon as they come over center, foul. We're up three points. Player didn't foul them. And they had a three-pointer to go into overtime, and we lost the game. Um, so it's amazing as a coach. Sometimes you think everything is crystal clear, obviously under the pressure of, you know, a big game. Sometimes kids make mistakes and they, they don't listen or they tune out. So it's very important. Again, I've heard some coaches talking about specifics and timeouts. How much information are you telling? Okay, so it's, you got to be careful with that. Um, I heard Mike Krzyzewski years ago talk about have expectations, not rules. As a young coach, I was thinking, oh, we got to have this, a rule for that rule. I think, you know, as I got to understand, if you make a rule, then you have something that you have to deal with deal with okay rather than the expectation so if you're backing yourself into a corner uh whether it be okay if you show up late you're not playing okay and, and sometimes coaches do that um, but i think every situation is different you have to talk to your players understand uh from day one we give them a list of expectations here um, and again i can share this with people later but um, we go through it first day and i say okay guys this is what my expectations are for you and oftentimes when kids screw up i come back to that and say do you remember that and I you know, often tell them, put it in your locker where you can see it every day. Um, and it's, it's right there for them. So as a coach, you want to think about those things and what your expectations are. Um, something I've also learned in coaching, you know, trust your gut. It's amazing how many things like, you know, I, I do spend a lot of time thinking about the games and ahead of time planning and preparing. What should I do? And, um, you know, it, it's often funny how your gut as a coach, it, it works out. You're right for whatever reason. Okay, trust that. Uh, most of the time you are right when you have that feeling. So pay attention to it. Um, I know as a baseball coach, I used to think, who should I pitch? What should I do? And almost every time I went against my gut feeling, I was wrong. And the, coach, the pitcher didn't have a great game. And it was the wrong matchup. Okay, so those are some things you want to think about, you know. Um, and I remember playing Cardinal Newman in the semis at Offsa. And it was one of those things. We hadn't played a lot of zone that year. And the game was tight and went in the fourth quarter. And we went to a 3-2 zone. It was the first time we'd used it. Um, I remember Andrew Sergi after the game, he says, oh, man, Zoner, I wasn't ready for that. You guys threw it at us. We didn't have a scout for that and uh, just threw us off. And we won the game by about 10 points. So sometimes, you know, you trust that gut instinct that you have and try something different. Um, and again, again, along the same lines, uh, don't be afraid to take that the road less traveled. Um, oftentimes, you know, you know, you're questioning. Um, oh, sorry, I just want to talk about the trust your gut. Another thing is about timeouts. OK, uh, down in Houston. Uh, I was coming down at the end of the game. Do you call a timeout or don't you? Okay, a very debatable issue in, in coaching. Um, Marcus Carr had the ball. And I said, you know what? Let him go. 
hits a three-pointer at the buzzer to put us in overtime. We win the game in the championship down in Houston. Um, in Erie, Pennsylvania, I'll show you in a minute. Um, 11 seconds, we get over center. Okay, I better call timeout. I don't know why. Okay, it's two different situations, two different uh, things I decided to do. Okay. Um, but don't be afraid to take the road less traveled. I've started guys in grade nine. And people say, what are you doing? This kid's not mature enough. Hey, listen, I, I trust this guy. I know it's a thing that I can do. Um, we've traveled down to the States. We've, we've kind of carved a path for a lot of teams in high school that hadn't done that before. Um, so it's important sometimes to, to do those things, try and play a tough schedule. Um, everybody's got their place. You know, it, it's interesting as a coach, you've got all kinds of different things that you run. Um, the more I watch some of these clinics, the more I go, holy smokes, I didn't know that was out there. Okay, and I think I've been around the game a long time, but um, you can run all kinds of different things. But ultimately, it's about knowing your players. Um, we had a situation, as I mentioned, down in Erie. Okay, who can I trust at the end of the game? Can it comes down to if I put the ball in the hands of, let's say, 14 out of my 15 guys, I think they're going to be shaking like a leaf because we're in a big gym. It's packed, uh, playing against the home team, Cathedral Prep, Burger King Classic. And I said, no, we're getting the ball to Danilo. And, and you know what? The other coach we talked after the game, he knew the ball was going to Danilo. And he told me after the game, his son came up and said, I actually fouled Danilo on the shot. And it was interesting that the guy from the newspaper comes over and he says, oh, coach, what a play you ran. It was, what were you thinking there? I said, listen, it doesn't take a genius to figure out, get the ball in your hands of your best player and let him go to work. So we ran something. And again, I knew I could trust Danilo. And as a coach, sometimes you got to figure out who are the guys, okay? He hit the three-pointer. This is what happened. We won the game. So sometimes keep it simple. Just recognize who are the guys you can trust. Okay. As a teacher, sometimes I know. Okay. I, I know I can trust that guy. Uh, ask him the question, the tough question. Uh, this is something it's, it's very difficult sometimes for us to realize. Sometimes in life, we get what we deserve. Okay. Um, you know, we had a couple of close calls, but we didn't win the Office of Championship as one of our goals. We were bronze medalists. And it's interesting, in 2016 and 18, Life worked out as it should, okay? In 2018, you know, we had told our kids, you need to listen to us very carefully, execute the game plan. Ultimately, one kid in a timeout at a critical situation didn't do that, and they hit a three-point, we lost the game because of it. Well, it wasn't the only reason, of course. Um, and again, credit to the guy for hitting the shot, but that was meant to be because we had had issues sometimes with players not listening, and that comes back to bite you. So. It's something you got to kind of realize. Sometimes life's going to work out the way it should be. Sometimes you don't deserve to win. Um, sometimes you'll get where, where you should be in the, in the experience, in the journey. Okay. Um, again, you know, we've used a lot of the experience we've, we, we've had over the years by playing tough games. Okay. Uh, to build the program, to go along that path. Okay. And um, I always admire those coaches that play tough schedules because ultimately you're teaching your kids things. Okay, it's going to shape you, it's going to develop you, uh, and then you're going to get better because of it. Okay, it makes you stronger. Um, I know years ago down the Freeds, um, Oakville Loyola used to kick our butt for a couple of years there. And I was like, man, we got to get those guys back. And, you know, we crossed that hurdle, you know, and, and the Catholic tournament. Uh, we've had a lot of success, seven out of the last nine championships. And there was, if you look, this is just the, the top part of it. There was many, many years I was at that tournament and we didn't even get out of the first round. Okay, so it's a process. And, you know, that experience of knowing what to expect. And it's amazing, you know, we've won a couple of years where the expectation is now we're going to win. And it's just a matter of going in with that confidence and telling our players, hey, guys, this is what we expect now. Okay. Um, I know I'm running low on time, so I'm just going to kind of quickly get through the last couple of slides here. Um, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Okay. And uh, my buddy always said, yeah, but you can drown the horse, but we can't do that. So um, it's interesting. How do you motivate? Okay. Um, all your players are different. It's important to get to know those guys, to have those conversations. Okay. I had a teak Jill. I was playing out at St. FX, uh, hit two free throws at the end of an offset championship with one second left. And it's amazing. I had just spoken to him a month earlier and I was talking about free throws. I go, Atik, you weren't very good from a line. Oh no, coach. No, you know, like I got it. I figured it out. I'm not going to miss the rest of the year. And when we get to the gold medal game with one second left, he's on the line. I said, remember that conversation? And he looked at me, he goes, I got him coach. And I knew he was going to make him. So it's amazing how you motivate players. In the semifinals in 2015, I had Nelson and Marcus as my two guards. And I pulled out a quote and I said, hey guys, I don't know if you know this, but the coach from the other team was talking back in January about his two best players. He has the best two guards in Canada. And I said, what do you guys think? 
And Nelson and Marcus were so angry about that comment. And it just motivated them, it got in their head. And Nelson went off for like 37 points that game. It was just unbelievable. You know, so again, motivations. Uh, Dave Smart talked about some stories that he's got. How do you motivate guys? And again, I'm always looking at different individuals. Some guys I can be tough on and give them a hard time. Other guys I got to baby a little bit. Okay, but ultimately I want them to compete. So something to look at for each of your individuals. How do you communicate with your players? Okay, again, we talked to them from day one, our expectations. Um, quick story here about, I did get teed up by an official. I wrote um, an email to Dave Lake. I said, Dave, what's going on? I never get teed up. I got teed up. I didn't think it was just. So he sends me back a, an email. And he says, well, the official uh, she, uh, was sick. Best friend was in the hospital. Um, single mom, uh, best friend in the hospital. The father was sick. All kinds of stuff going on. He goes, Jeff, could you let it go? I said, Dave, you got it. So sometimes you don't know what's going on the other side. And by communicating, that can help. Okay. A lot of you watched the last dance here with Michael Jordan. Okay. How's he communicating with him versus dealing with this guy? Okay. So um, we all have those people. How do you motivate a guy or how do you deal with some of those individuals on a different level and be fair with them as well? So some great stories um, from that point. Okay. Um, we need to be leaders. Okay. Bringing people together. I want them, as I said, to reach their potential. How are we going to support them in pursuit of those goals? Um, you know, some of our players say to me, I want to be at the next level. Okay, well, we're going to try and support them. And again, some of these guys um, go on and they're not going to play basketball at some point, but they can still be leaders in different areas. Um, going back to the start, what was your vision? Okay, the who, what, where, when, why, how? How are you going to do it? Okay. Uh, I remember one of my coaches way back said, keep things short, don't talk too much. I, I think I've definitely been talking a lot. Um, just a final task for you, going back to what I said at the beginning. Uh, maybe you can come up with something that you learned or one lesson that you learned in this uh, session okay and uh, going back to what i said one of your ideas plus something else you learned just keep adding to that and i think as a coach um, if you can be an ongoing life learner then you're going to get better and better and i think at some point maybe you'll get to that that situation where um, as coach jockums mentioned you know there's almost an expectation that we're going to win and when it does happen um, it's not a surprise and, and i know that you know i had a feeling that uh, our program was developing into this. Okay, so I think it's something that um, when you put it all together and you, you build that um, program that you want based on all those visions that you have and the success that you have uh, from your perspective, that you're gonna be successful. So with that, um, just wanna say thank you. I do have my email on here. So if anybody wants to reach out and ask me any questions that we have more time for, or if I can help you in any way, uh, I'd be happy to, and uh, I can share the PowerPoint if anybody wants it as well. So thanks, Tanner, if that's okay. Oh, that's great. Uh, thanks very much, Coach, and I uh, appreciate you taking us through not only your journey, but uh, a bit of an inside track on uh, on all of the success that you've had and, and how you've been able to accomplish that. I'll kick things off with uh, questions. And being at uh, a school for a long period of time, how have you um, worked with different administrators, worked with different teachers, other coaches, uh, you know, that are maybe all sharing the same athletes? How have you found that to be a balancing act? Yeah, it's a challenge because, uh, again, you get to know different uh, administrators as they come in, come and go in some cases. Um, and I think, you know, the one thing I've always had faith in is, hey, look, we're doing things the right way. And if, if um, there's any questions, um, and I always tell the players, look, if a teacher comes to me and says something, um, and I had this actually happen, if a teacher comes to me and says, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about this guy, and I do reach out to a lot of the kids in our school and, and the other teachers and say, look, let me know if this guy's struggling. And I had a teacher say to me, geez, I didn't know you were going to support uh, me and, and I wish I knew that earlier. And I, and I said, that's my mistake. I should have let you know he was a new teacher. But I had a teacher come across the, the gym floor right at the beginning of a game. He said, so-and-so didn't do his homework. Uh, there was an assignment he didn't hand in. And I told him like this and that. And basically I was put on the spot. Like, what am I going to do? And so I told the player, I said, look, I just got this from the teacher, which I didn't think was fair coming across the gym to do it at that time, but that's okay. I said, I'm not going to play you for the first half. We're going to talk about this at halftime. And we'll figure it out. Because, I mean, the game was literally just about to start. Went into the dressing room at halftime. And I said, what's, what's going on? And I said, look, I had to support the teacher. Uh, the kid gave me his version. And I took him at his word. And we built that trust. And I said, okay, this needs to be taken care of. And there was some miscommunication, I guess. And, um, again, I think if you communicate with teachers and some of the people in our, our staff understand that, I'm going to take their side. I tell the players that. And I said, you can't take yourself out of the equation of what we're doing. 
it's really important to do the academics um, because, again, there's been situations where uh, guys have been taken out and uh, they put themselves in that position. So you know, we're all trying to get a common goal here is, is to get the kids better in the academics and the athletics. Uh, I think it works, um, you know, and I think it's important that uh, you, you let kids know that you're supporting the school vision as well. Sure, that's great. Uh, last one for you then. I mean, we hear so often that uh, the kids are different today, you know, right? And that, uh, that we've gone through. In your experience, I mean, do you think that holds up? And, or, or what do you feel about coaching, you know, uh, athletes in, in 2020? Yeah, I think, I think kids are different, yet kids are the same. So I think there's a paradox there that, you know, kids are kids. They're going to do some of the silly things and make mistakes and all that. Um, there's obviously different distractions. It's a different world growing up that they're in. Um, but the one thing I can tell you, and I think this goes back to, um, we're all aware, in, in, especially in Toronto where we are, basketball is flourishing. Kids want to play. Um, you know, and again, we've had some success, and I think kids want to be a part of it. And I think, you know, there's an eagerness on kids' part to, to play the game. I think, you know, even when I started out 25 years ago, um, oftentimes we were dealing with kids who, maybe playing two sports and, and they didn't focus on basketball. I think kids have those opportunities now to play year round. Um, they will want to get better. I think there's so many more kids playing um, and playing at a pretty good level. Um, so I think we have to embrace that sometimes and say, Hey, you know what, let's give these kids the opportunities. Um, and it goes back to, again, I think some of the, the things that we've talked about, there's some things I don't do differently than 25 years ago, because again, I think I believe in those. Um, some of my mentors have taught me the right way. And I think I'm trying to teach those lessons and I think kids respond to that. So again, even though there are differences, um, there's a lot of similarities too. And I think um, when you have that communication with them, you give them the expectations um, and you don't lower the bar. If you give them that, I think they'll rise up to it and you will, you will see that the, the kids are capable of a lot. And uh, if you put that in front of them, they'll chase it. Oh, perfect. Well, thank you again, uh, Coach. Really appreciate the time. And uh, as uh, Coach has said, if anybody uh, wants to get in contact, more than willing to uh, to share and to, to keep on with it. So, Coach, we'll leave you with the final word. But again, a huge thank you. Okay. First of all, I want to thank you, Tanner. Uh, you guys are doing an amazing job. This is uh, something, as I say, we used to have to pay some money and spend a, a weekend in the hotel and things like that and travel and, and try to get the support to go and do it. You guys have given us a great platform for everybody to learn. I know some people were reaching out even from Taiwan and Korea asking me about this. So hopefully people get a chance to see it. Uh, not just my um, talk. Um, Chris and Dave as well. Thank you. Um, you know, I think, as I said at the beginning, it's, it's really important just to keep learning. Um, this is a great opportunity just to pick up one or two things from each coach and uh, put it to your program, put it to your situation. I think ultimately that will make you a better teacher and coach, um, which I think is important. And, and again, we're, we're not perfect. Uh, we're trying to do the best we can. And I think once you outline your vision of success, then um, you'll get there. So thank you for the opportunity. And uh, by all means, reach out if anybody wants uh, any feedback or any questions. I'd be happy to help.